This week, our lesson is self-contained in that we're uh, talking, and we're going to start and finish talking about a topic called graph theory. Often when we analyze theoretical problems, it's useful to transform the problem into a collection of vertices joined by lines. For example, when he was visiting the city of Königsberg, a Swiss mathematician called Euler was set a problem by the people living in that city. In order to solve this problem, he invented a new type of mathematics, which is now called graph theory. The town of Königsberg, which is now called Kaliningrad, was divided into four landmasses by a river. There were seven bridges joining the land masses together, as shown in this picture. And visitors to the city were often set upon by the locals. Can a person walk around the city and cross each bridge once and only once? Euler was the first person to solve this problem. And he solved it using graph theory. What Oya did was he realized that the streets and the buildings don't matter. All that matters are the bridges and the land masses. So instead of a picture like this, instead he could think of it as a picture like this. There's four land masses labeled A, B, C, a, B, C, and D, and seven bridges. For example, bridge number one connects B to D, bridge number two connects A to D, etc. Euler realized that instead of studying the picture on the left, he could just study the picture on the right. So, graph theory, which originally was just interesting mathematicians because we could solve riddles or puzzles, now has lots of interested applications in computing, in physics, in neurology, in chemistry, etc. What is a graph? A graph is formed by points, which are called vertices, and lines, which are called edges. For vertices, we use lowercase letters, A, B, C, etc. The edge from a vertex called U to a vertex called V is written like this. Round bracket U comma V, round bracket. The vertices U and V are called endpoints of the edge E. We have a non-empty set of vertices, V, together with a set of edges called E. This is, we call this a graph, and we write this as G of V and E. An edge which starts and finishes at the same vertex is called a loop. Here's an example of a graph. We have three vertices and four edges. The vertices, for the vertices, I'm using blue circles. For the edges, I'm using red lines. Note that edge number four starts and finishes at the same vertex. So edge number four is called a loop. I suppose you were given a question like this. You're told that capital V is a set containing four vertices, A, B, C, and D, and capital E is the set containing five edges, E1 up to E5. And we're told that E1 is an edge which connects A with B, E2 is an edge which connects B with C, etc. And the question says, draw the graph G which has a set of vertices V and a set of edges E. The first thing to do is to draw the vertices. We have four vertices, A, B, C, and D. 
I could draw them like this if I wanted to. But it doesn't have to be like this. We could draw them any way we wanted to. Maybe I wanted them like this. I've swapped positions of C and D. Or maybe I want to draw them all in line, or maybe like this. These are all correct. For this example, I'm choosing to draw A, B, and C, and D like this. Then we need to draw the edges. H1 connects A with B. Draw H1. H2 connects B with C. We can draw H2 and so on. H3 connects C with D. H4 connects A with C. H5 connects B with D. And then we're finished. This is the answer to this question. This is one answer to this question, but depending on how you choose to draw your vertices A, B, C, D, of course there are many correct answers. Two edges which have the same endpoints are called parallel edges. A simple graph is a graph without parallel edges or loops. If a graph contains parallel edges, then it is called a multigraph. In this picture, the edge which I'm calling edge one and the edge which I'm calling edge two, both have endpoints B and C. These two edges are parallel edges. Because this graph contains parallel edges, this is called a multigraph. A pseudograph is a non-simple graph in which both loops and parallel edges are produced. We have a pair of parallel edges and we have a loop in this picture. If we have a graph like this, and if E is the edge connecting U with V, then we can say that U and V are neighbors in this graph. The degree of a vertex in a graph like this is the number of edges connected to that vertex. When we count the degree of the vertex, if there's a loop, we count this loop as two, because it has two ends attached to the same vertex. For example, here's a graph called G. Give the degrees of all the vertices in G. First, I want to look at A. A has two edges connected to it, so the degree of A is two. Vertex B has four edges connected to it, so the degree of vertex B is four. The degree of C is also four, and the degree of D is one. The degree of E, we can count the edges, one, two, three. So the degree of E is three. The degree of F is four, and the degree of G is zero. Let's do another one. Give the degrees of all the vertices in this graph, which is called H. The degree of A is three. For B, one, two, three, four. And then a loop, which we count twice, so five, six. The degree of B is six. The degree of C is one. The degree of e, D is five. And the degree of E is also five. If we have a vertex which which does not have an edge. In other words, if we have a vertex of degree zero, then it is called an isolated vertex. For example, in this graph, G is an isolated vertex. 
A vertex of degree 1, for example, D, is called a pendant. The first theorem of today. Let's suppose we have a pseudograph. That's a graph in which parallel edges are allowed and loops are allowed. And let's suppose NE, the number of elements in set E, or to say it another way, the number of edges in the graph. Then we have a formula for N of E. N of E is a half of the sum of the, all of the degrees. We go back. In this graph, we can add up the degrees. It's 3 plus 6 plus 1 plus 5 plus 5 is 20. And 20 divided by 2 is 10. The theorem says that there are 10 edges in this graph. Let's count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The number of edges is always equal to a half of the sum of the degrees. Next example. We're told that a graph has 10 vertices and that the degree of each vertex is 4. How many edges does this graph have? We're told that there are 10 vertices. Let's call them V1 up to V10. By the theorem we've just seen, the number of edges should be equal to a half multiplied by the sum of the degrees. But that's a half of 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4, etc. A half of 40 or 20. The graph described here must have 20 edges. <coughs> Sometimes we might want to assign directions to the edges. And instead of just lines, we show this using arrows. If the edges in the graph have directions, then the graph is called a directed graph or digraph. If a directed graph has parallel edges, then it's a directed multigraph or multidigraph. In a graph, all of the edges are the same type. That all either don't have a direction and we draw them as lines, or they all have directions and we draw them as arrows. We never mix the two types of edges together. Let G be a directed graph, a graph where all of the edges have directions. And if we write that the edge E is equal to open bracket U comma V close bracket, then the order of U and V is important. This edge starts at U and it finishes at V. In other words, if this is U and V, the arrow goes from U to V. If we are in an undirected graph, then it doesn't matter which order we write U and V. We can also talk about degrees of vertices in a directed graph. But now we need two different types of degree. The in degree and the out degree. And this might be as you expect. The in degree, which we call degree minus, is the number of edges coming into V. The out degree is the number of edges coming out of V. If we have, have a loop, then we count it as one for both the in degree and the out degree. Here's an example. Find the in degree and out degree of every vertex in this graph. First, let's look at A. 
the in degree, how many arrows are pointing towards A. Here's one and here's one. This should be two. How many arrows are coming out of A? One, two, three, four. The out degree of A must be four. Next move to B. The in degree, one, two arrows coming into B must be two. And the out degree is only one arrow coming out of B, so the out degree of B must be one. And so on. Before I go on, let's add up these numbers. First, the in degrees. We have 2 plus 2 plus 3 plus 2 plus 3. That's 12. The out degrees. 4 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 3. That's also 12. How many edges are there? Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. This graph has twelve edges. The sum of the in degrees is twelve, and the sum of the out degrees is twelve. In fact, we can. In fact, this is a rule which is always true. The number of edges in the graph is always equal to the sum of the in degrees and always equal to the sum of the out degrees. A simple graph, that's a graph with no parallel edges and no loops, which includes all possible edges, is called a complete graph. So it's another way. In a complete graph, every vertex has, has an edge with every other vertex. If we have a complete graph with n vertices, we write this as k subscript n. Now, what is the degree of a vertex in kn? kn has n vertices, and each one is connected to the other n minus 1 vertices. So each vertex has n minus 1 edges connected to it. So the degree of each vertex is n minus 1. By the previous theorem, the total number of edges must be n minus 1 multiplied by the number of vertices and then divided by 2. Some examples. K1, the complete, uh, complete graph with only one vertex. K2 was two vertices and one edge connecting them to two. K3, three vertices, each one is connected to the other two, so in total there are three edges, and so on. A planar graph is a graph which can be drawn in the plane in such a way that its edges intersect only at their endpoints. Now here's a graph which doesn't look to be planar because it looks like two of the edges are crossing over. A planar graph is a graph that you can draw where none of the edges intersect or cross over. But this graph is a planar graph because if you rearrange the vertices and the edges, it's possible to draw it in such a way that none of these edges intersect each other. So this is a planar graph. A graph which is not a planar graph, in other words, a graph which can only be drawn without intersecting edges in three-dimensional space, is called a three-dimensional graph. Here's an example of a three-dimensional graph. Now, 
I've drawn it in such a way that we're imagining that the edge from A to C is somehow above the edge connecting B to E. I'm going to leave it for you to think about, for you to convince yourself that this is not a planar graph. It's not possible to rearrange the vertices and the edges such that none of these edges cross over. Suppose that n is greater than equal to 3, and suppose that v is the set containing n vertices. Suppose we have an edge which connects v1 to v2, and an edge which connects v2 to v3, and so on. v3 is connected to v4, v4 is connected to v5, and so on. And then the final vertex, vn, is also connected to v1. Then we have a cycle graph. These are the first four cycle graphs because we need to start with three vertices, C3, C4, C5, and C6. If we take Cn and we add a new vertex in the middle, which is connected to all of the other vertices, then we get a graph which is called a wheel graph. There's perhaps a little bit of confusing notation here. W3 has four vertices because we've started with C3 and then we've added one more. A bipartite graph is a graph where the set of vertices V can be divided into two distinct subsets such that each edge connects a vertex in V1 with a vertex in V2. In a bipartite graph, there's no edges going from V1 to V2, and there are no edges going from V2 to V2. For example, the graph C6, which a few slides ago I drew as a hexagon, now I'm choosing to draw like this. The vertices shown here as V1, V2, and V3. I am drawing in a set called V1, and vertices v4, v5, v6, and same are in the subset v2. Know that all of the edges go from the left to the right. There are no edges which, which connect a left vertex to a left vertex, and there are no edges which connect a right vertex to a right vertex. This graph is bipartite. An example is this graph bipartite. To answer this question, we need two colored pens. And we're going to color in the vertices. Pick a vertex, any vertex, it doesn't matter where you start. Let's just say we start with B, and let's suppose that I'm going to color B in orange. Then I'm going to change to my other pen. I'm going to change to a green pen. And every vertex which is connecting to B, I'm going to color in green. C is connected to B, E is connected to B, and F is connected to B. Now, before we go on, are any of the green vertices connected together? The answer is no. C is not connected to E, C is not connected to F, E is not connected to F. So far, so good. Then we change back to the orange pen. Every vertex which is connected to a green vertex should be colored orange. A and D are connected to a green vertex, so we color them in. A quick check. Are any of the orange vertices connected together? The answer is no. A is not connected to B, A is not connected to D, and B is not connected to D. Change back to the green pen and color every vertex which is connected to orange green. We have A, B, and D colored in orange. C, E, F, and D are colored in green. Because we do not have an orange vertex connected to an orange vertex, and we do not have a green vertex connected to a green vertex. This graph is bipartite. 
If we wanted to, we could show it like this. We could draw all the orange vertices on the left, draw the green vertices on the right, and then draw exactly the same edges that we had before. Every edge goes from an orange vertex to a green vertex. This graph is bipartite. What about this one? Is this graph bipartite? We use our same technique. We take out two pens. We pick any vertex to start with. It doesn't matter where we start. And we color it in. Let's suppose I color D in green. And then I change to my orange pen. And I connect, I color every vertex connected to D in orange. Now there's a problem here, look. E and F are both colored in orange, but E and F are connected together. That tells us that this graph is not a bipartite. A big part of graph theory is the idea of walks. What is a walk? A walk is a list like this, V0, E1, V2, E2, etc., ending at EK, VK. This is a list of vertex, edge, vertex, edge, vertex, edge, vertex, edge, ending in vertex. And it's, it needs to satisfy the rule that the edge EI, which is between VI1 I minus 1 and VI must connect VI minus 1 and VI. So in other words, if we have V0 and V1, edge E1 must connect V0 to V1. Edge E2, the second, the next one in the list must connect V1 to V2, etc. For example, here is a walk shown with green arrows. I want to start at A. I want to walk from A to B along E1. And then I want to walk to E along E5. And then use E4 to get to D. Use E3 to get to C. Use E6 to get to F. Use E7 to get to G. And then use E7 again to go back to F. We can write this walk, this collection of green arrows, as A, E1, B, E5, E, E4, D, E3, C, E6, F, E7, G, E7, F. An Euler and trail is a walk which satisfies two rules. Rule number one, no edge is repeated in the walk, and rule number two, every edge is included. This walk, D, E5, E, etc., is an Euler and trail. Each of the 10 edges appears once and only once in this list. Let's color this in. I'm going to start at D. I'm going to use E5 to get to E. And then I'm going to use E6 to get to A. And E7 to get to F. E8 to get to B. E1 to get to back to A. E4 to get to D. P3 to get to C. E10 to get to G. E9 to get to B and then E2 to get to C. This walk includes each of the 10 edges once and only once, so this is an Euler in trail. The Konigsberg bridge problem, which we started this lesson by mentioning, can be rephrased as following. Does there exist an Euler in trail in the Konigsberg? We'll answer this soon. A graph is connected if there exists a walk between every pair of vertices. In these two pictures, graph H is connected 
it doesn't matter where in the graph you start, it's always possible to walk to any other vertex. Graph G is not connected because if we start at G, we can't walk to, say, A. Theorem. Let G be a connected graph. Then there exists an Eulerian trail if and only if the number of vertices of an odd degree is either 0 or 2. Furthermore, if G has two vertices of odd degree, then the Eulerian trail must start and finish at these two vertices. Look at these graphs, the complete graphs. In E3, we can count the degrees. The degree here is 2, degree 2, the degree 2. Every vertex has even degree, so there exists an Eulerian trail. Likewise, in K5, the degree of each vertex is 4. So again, there exists an Eulerian trail in K5. But all four vertices in K4 have degree 3. These are all odd degrees. There's four vertices of odd degree. So K4 does not contain an Eulerian trail. What about this one? This graph we've already seen does contain an Eulerian trail, and we've already written it down. We can calculate the degrees of all of the vertices. The degree of A is 4, the degree of B is 4, the degree of C is 3, the degree of D is 3, the degree of E is 2, the degree of F is 2, and the degree of G is 2. There are two vertices of odd degree, and every other vertex has even degree. The theorem tells there must exist an Eulerian trail, and it must start and finish at D. We've already found this trail. We drew a, a trail which started at D and finished at C. Now let's go back to Konigsberg. Does there exist an Eulerian trail in Konigsberg? In calculus, Calculate the degrees of the vertices. The degree of A is 3, the degree of B is 5, the degree of 3, 1, 2, 3, and the degree of D, 1, 2, 3. There are four vertices of odd degree.
so far, three votes for yes, two votes for no, and seven people who have not voted yet. The answer is no. The firm says that only exists an oil and trail if the number of vertices which have an odd degree is either zero or two. But here we have four vertices of odd degree. So therefore, there does not exist an oil and trail in Konigsberg. This means it was not possible to walk around the city and cross each bridge once and only once. This was a problem which existed for many, many years and was first solved by Euler. One more idea for today's lesson, the idea of Euler's formula for polyhedra. Euler's formula is the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. For example, let's suppose we have a cube. A cube has eight vertices or eight corners. It has 12 edges and it has six faces. Euler's formula is number of vertices minus number of edges plus number of faces. Eight minus 12 plus six is equal to two. Let's look at another three-dimensional polyhedra. For example, a tetrahedron. A tetrahedron has four vertices, six edges, and four faces. Euler's formula, four minus six plus four is equal to two. Hmm. This is interesting, two again. Is that a coincidence? Let's carry on. Next, what about a pyramid? A square-based pyramid. The pyramid has five vertices, one at the top and four at the bottom, eight edges and five faces. Five minus eight plus five is, oh, two again. What about a dodecahedron? Dodecahedron has 12 faces and each one is a pentagon. There are 20 vertices, 30 edges and 12 faces. Euler's formula that does 20 minus 30 plus 12, which is, oh, it's two again. Let's look at a football, and by football I mean this object with, which is made of 12 pentagons and 20 hexagons. How many faces? Well, there's 12 and 20, so there must be 32 faces. How many vertices? Well, there's 12 pentagons, and each pentagon has five vertices. So 12 multiplied by 30, there must be 60 vertices. What about the edges? We could take the number of vertices, that's 60. Each vertex as degree three, because there's three edges connected to each vertex, but then we're counting each vertex twice, because each edge is connected to two different vertices. So we don't need to divide by two. 60 multiplied by three is 180, divided by two gives us 90. And by Euler's formula, that's 60 minus 90 plus 32, which is 2 again.
If we have a polyhedra like this, which doesn't have any holes in it, is Euler's formula always equal to 2? And if the answer is yes, how can we prove that it's always equal to 2? In mathematics, a technique that we often use is that we change a problem into a different problem, which on the surface of it looks like a different problem, but is really the same problem. In this case, we're going to turn our problem of a three-dimensional polyhedra into a graph theory problem because we already have, we've already developed some theory of graph, about graphs. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a polyhedra such as this cube. We're going to remove one of the faces. Let's suppose we lift the top off and we throw the top away. We're going to stretch it out and then squash it flat. And we have something which looks like this. Now look, we still have the same number of vertices. We still have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. We still have the same number of edges, but we have one less face. To account for the face which I took off and I threw away, I'm going to count all of the outside. I'm going to count the regions, one, two, three, four, five, and then all of this outside I'm going to count as the sixth face. In this graph, I have eight vertices, 12 edges, and six faces. We could do the same thing for tetrahedra. Remove one of the faces, squash it flat, and then count the outside in place of the face that we took off and we threw away. Four vertices, six edges, and four faces. We could do a pyramid like this. Let's say we remove the bottom of the pyramid, squash it flat, and then we count, calculate, we count this outside region as the fifth face. Or something like this letter T. We can change into a graph like this. 16 vertices, 24 edges, and 10 faces. What's Euler's formula? 16 minus 24, that's minus 8, plus 10, oh, again, equal to 2. Every three-dimensional polyhedron is equivalent to a connected planar simple graph. So if we know something about such graphs, about connected planar simple graphs, then we also know it about polyhedra. What do we know about these graphs? Let's start with the first complete graph, K1. There's a picture of K1. We have one vertex, zero edges, and one face, which is all of this outside region we call face number one. Euler's formula is 1 minus 0 plus 1, or 2. Now let's suppose we take any connected planar simple graph, any possible graph that you could think of. Here's some graph which I've just drawn. This graph is connected. It's possible to walk from any vertex to any vertex. It's, in, it's planar, that means none of, the vertex, none of the edges are crossing over, and it's simple. There are no loops and there are no parallel edges. What can we do to this graph? One thing we could do is we could cut off a pendant vertex like this. Let's suppose I cut just here and I threw that part away. What happens to the number of vertices? 
the number of vertices decreases by one because I've thrown one away. What happens to the number of edges? The number of edges also decreases by one because we can cut one edge off and we throw it away. But the number of faces stays the same. We haven't changed the number of faces. So NV goes down by one, and E goes down by one, and NF stays the same. So that's minus one, minus, minus one, plus zero. But minus one, minus, minus one is just zero. Euler's formula stays the same when we cut off a pendant vertex. What else could we do? We could connect, we could cut an edge which is not connected to a pendant vertex. And suppose we cut this edge and we remove this edge. What happens to our numbers? The number of vertices stays the same, we haven't changed that. The number of edges decreases by one because we'll cut it and throw it away. And now the number of faces also decreases by one because what was inside and outside is now all one face. So NV minus NE plus NF stays the same. There's two things we can do. We can remove a pendant vertex or we can cut an edge which is not connected to a pendant vertex. And each time we do one of these, Euler's formula stays the same. So let's carry on doing this. There's another pendant vertex here. Let's cut this off. Euler's formula will stay the same. And then let's keep going. Let's keep simplifying the graph. Every time we do a simplification, Euler's formula doesn't change. And what are we left with? We're left with the trivial graph K1. That means every connected plane of simple graph has the same Euler's formula as K1. So every connected plane of simple graph has Euler formula equal to 2. And because this is true for every connected plane of simple graph, it must also be true for every polyhedra without holes. And that is the end of this week's lesson. Next week there's no lesson because we're going to be having an exam. It will be a multiple choice exam. Um, similar perhaps to the homework, although You'll only be allowed one attempt at the midterm exam, and you'll only be able to see one question at a time. Would you like to ask anything to me?